Hello, welcome to a new series regarding SD1. I'm your host Dimitri, and it will be my pleasure to uh, describe uh, the benefits that this new technology brings. Um, explore further to see if um, that will help you and your business. Um, and taking that further, uh, understand uh, what VMware's take is on this. Now, I've been um, selling uh, and designing SD1 uh, a few years now. Uh, I have recently taken the decision to join uh, VMware because I believe that their technology is amazing and it hits the right points. Um, and as I find out more about the technology and as I, uh, let's say, fall in love more and more with VeloCloud, um, that's the name of the SD1. Um, I want to share those uh, teachings with you. Now, uh, my aim is not really to make anything uh, marketing focused. Uh, there are lots of webinars uh, that I would recommend you uh, join. There are lots of materials out there, uh, white papers, etc. Um, this is going to be a bit more personal uh, and a bit more to the point. Uh, not everything is working as it should, um, so I'll try to be brutally honest uh, to uh, show you also the downsides, so obviously you will know what things to be looking after, uh, but obviously I'll emphasize a lot on the benefits of going with an SD1 solution from VMware. Now, the first um, session is all about SD1. It's I think it's been a term that uh, a lot of people have used, uh, a buzzword, um, there are lots of definitions out there for SD1, uh, but um, I think we should start from the basics and understand exactly what's going on, uh, what shifts most of the customers, including yourself, might be experiencing in the wide area network, and then try to understand how a technology like SD1 can help. So uh, we go to the whiteboard. So, in order for us to understand what the issue is, let's look at how traditional wide area networks were architected. Now, I hope to make a lot of drawings uh, in this series, and if the writing uh, might get a bit bad, I do apologize. I've been told that my writing can be rubbish at times, uh, but hopefully uh, this is clear enough. So. What do we have here? A typical setup that consists of the branch local area network. So these are different devices, computers that you give the staff in order for them to carry their day-to-day -day activities. And on the other hand, you have the data center. Now, traditionally, all the resources that we as employees would access are in the company's own data center. That's something that they own, that they maintain themselves. So a non-descriptive server is placed here. And the whole point of wide area networks is to connect this user here with the data on the server here. Now, again, traditionally, uh, we use private networks. Uh, MPLS is a really great example. And that's something that you can go to uh, any internet service provider and can ask for. So for example, you go to somebody um, in your um, country and you'll say, okay, I want to connect these branches to my main data center or data centers. Um, you'd have routers uh, at the branches, obviously routers at the data center, uh, connecting both of them together. Uh, and then you'll have the user being able to connect to the server. Now, this is from the days in which most applications were never really uh, bandwidth hungry. Um, users were maybe not expecting to uh, be able to use their own devices. Um, again, this local area network is most likely highly regulated, um, so guests cannot access it. 
but a fundamental shift has happened over the last few years. First of all, these applications here move to the cloud. So if I can just grab a blue marker, I can draw it here. More and more applications are now found in the cloud, right? So they're accessible over the internet. Not all, but you'll see more and more companies investing in that. Secondly, users are now expected to come and use their own devices and have more freedom at work, right? In order to maybe browse social media at lunchtime or YouTube. Um, again, that's additional strain on the underlying network. Last but not least, you guess guests, right? I mean, back in the old days, uh, nobody expected to have free internet access, uh, you know, in a restaurant or, uh, you know, in the retail store, uh, but these days are over. Uh, you don't provide that and uh, you might as well, um, you know, sign your uh, death warrant on uh, social media and any review sites, right? Um, totally forgot to mention IoT. Uh, more and more things become connected to the internet and want connectivity to it. So as you start understanding that this place here, the link between the branches and the data center becomes a congestion point. Also, if you look at this, it's not particularly optimal to travel from the branch into the data center, have a centralized breakout, and then go to the internet. Same for the guests and same for the non-business critical traffic. Why do I need to traverse this small pipe that gets congested or to come back all the way to the data center and break out locally, potentially going back to where I started? So, obviously, there are people out there who say, okay, Dimitri, fair enough, I'll just go to my provider and I'll just double the bandwidth. I'll triple it, quadruple it. And yeah, obviously that is a reason. That's a short-term reasoning which you can come in here and you can pay your service provider and probably a lot of money because MPLS tends to be expensive in most territories. Uh, and you can upgrade the bandwidth or maybe bring a different circuit, right? But you can't utilize like a normal broadband line or LTE. Both of them have decreased in cost significantly over the last few years and they became more and more reliable. So if I was to look at the problems, yes, you have a scalability problem and also you have an efficiency problem. And this is where SD1 comes in because we can fundamentally re-architect this in order to ensure an optimal way of traffic flow and also potential cost savings. Now I have just redrawn this uh, in order to better emphasize um, the flexibility that an SD1 solution can bring. So as you see, we still have our data center, we still have potential apps uh, uh, remaining there. Uh, we moved some things to the cloud. Now I put there Office 365 because I think that's an example that resonates with, uh, with a lot of people. So things that are accessed just on the internet. So think about any software as a service or even infrastructure as a service. And again, you have the branch, the branch where you have your users working, um, maybe um, enjoying a bit of social media during uh, break times. You have your IoT devices, you have your guests, those are things that want to get out. So, how can we connect the sites together? So, obviously, inter site connectivity is still paramount. However, now we can use different ways of transport. So we're not really reliant on an MPLS link. We're not really reliant on very long lead times or potentially expensive circuits to connect the sites together. So an SD1 solution is transport agnostic. It doesn't really care. Might be broadband, might be MPLS, might be a 3G, 4G or soon 5G. It doesn't really matter. It's just another way 
to create an overlay between the two sides. So I'm just gonna draw an overlay here. Now this is very important because again, this gives you the flexibility to take a look back and understand where you have issues, where you want to decrease cost, and now you have loads of options to consider. Now, on top of these uh, new overlay circuits, you can start doing very smart things. Now, if you consider loads of the apps that we use today, voice, video, etc., they are really susceptible to lines going bad. And when I mean going bad, not going down altogether. I mean, dropping packets, uh, having delays in transmission, having a lot of jitter, these things impact uh, the app significantly. Take voice, for example, more than 2% loss on link will mean that the person you're speaking to um, doesn't really understand what you're saying and vice versa. Now, having these smart SD1 boxes actually allows you to understand how healthy the circuits are from a quality of service perspective and start routing based on that. So there's no routing protocols, there's no traditional metrics that you obviously you used to in BGP and OSPF. No, the quality of service dictates what's the best path so your business critical applications have the best chance in making it across. Now, what about the traffic that doesn't go side to side? Now that we can use broadband, now we can use LTE, we can look at direct internet access, right? So why clog your link? Why pay a lot of money to bring all this useless traffic back to headquarters when you can just let it go outside? So now when this user tries to access Office 365, he doesn't need to travel back on a congested night to, date, to the data center and then get translated and let out to the internet, he can do that on the most optimal path. Again, some of these applications do require the best possible network and the fastest transmission, and that can only be done when you're obviously routing on the shortest path. Now, there are lots of nuances to this, and there are loads of processes to optimize this and a lot of advantages of an SD1 technology. But if I was to summarize, I'm mainly looking at things such as performance and cost. Let me write them down for you. So let's spend a bit of time. Performance. We already talked about the fact that private lines tend to get oversubscribed. And even if they are not, you're basically wasting precious, precious time to get traffic back to the data center just so we can get out of the internet. With a new SD1 solution, you now have the option to have direct internet access and access these resources, whatever they are, software as a service, infrastructure as a service, uh, cloud security, think about Zscaler, accessing it as fast and as efficient as possible. One thing that we didn't really look at when it comes to the actual solution is the cost. Now, I did mention that in certain territories, MPLS lines tend to be quite expensive. And that's true. That's true in the US, for example, but it might not be true in Europe. So one of the things that confuses people is um, they hear an SD1 pitch. Uh, the pitch revolves only around the cost savings, when you go from MPLS into a more uh, uh, internet-based transport, um, people do the maths, it doesn't add up. So then they are back to square one. They're wondering, well, okay, this sounds cool. This looks like a cool feature, but how does it actually improve my business? Cost is not just about the things that you pay for transport, right? Remember, there is a cost of deploying a network and maintaining it. Now, this is the clever bit about SD1. Now, traditionally, the way that we have configured branch routers is through command line and one by one. 
That's the way how we do it. You want to deploy a site, you send a technician there, he's skilled enough to uh, understand how to talk to the actual box itself. It configures it, it creates an out-of-band connection in order to potentially uh, manage it from uh, you know when he goes uh, away. But that takes ages, that takes time, that takes skilled personnel that have to be paid a great deal of money to go to a remote site and bring it back up. Now, after you bring it up, you will need to push different policies, right? So we just maybe enforced Office 365 or Skype for Business, and they require a new subset of rules. First of all, in a traditional CLI world that's based on layer three, maybe layer four characteristics, IP and ports, that's quite hard to do. Secondly, just the sheer volume of doing this. Think about if you have 200 or 2000 branches, it's gonna take you forever to implement this. And uh, to be honest, how many businesses today can wait that time? With SD1, things are fundamentally different because now you have this concept of orchestrator, which will be able to touch and configure all these boxes remotely from a single place and all UI driven. So it's very easy to express your business policy to say, hey, this is what's important for me, Office 365, Skype for Business, the SD1 solution understands that and is able to configure itself and then apply the right policies. And this rollout can be done extremely, extremely fast. And obviously things do break from time to time. Like, let's be honest, um, there's somebody who always unplugs the cable or, uh, um, you know, a line card gets faulty, etc. Uh, with traditional networks, it, it's very hard to troubleshoot things remotely. And yes, obviously you can put a third party system on top to give you some sort of visibility and yes, it might work. Um, I've been a network engineer uh, a few years and I remember a lot of issues when the systems were not outputting the right data. With SD1, you get that visibility. Not only you get that visibility when it comes to troubleshooting and you have a lot of remote troubleshooting tools that actually will allow you to save time and cost. You don't have to go there while the site is not running in order to fix it, you can do most things remotely, but even give you the visibility of what's going on. Remember, there are so many things using your network. Employees, guests, bring your own device, IoT. How can you improve your network and how can you secure it if you don't know what's going on? Now, SD1 will help because most SD1 solution have native inbuilt reports and functionality to show you exactly what's going on. So next time you're prioritizing an app or blocking something else, you have the right information in order to do so faster and more efficient. Now, in the next video, we're gonna run through uh, the basic components of the VMware SD1, VeloCloud, and we're gonna start tying pieces together and understanding exactly what options do we have and how can we go from the painful traditional one into the next generation SD1. Thank you for watching.